Oh, so what I'll further do, you know, I am very anxious, you know, to hear our conversation and the discussion, particularly as it relates to the movement for African American equality and what we need to do now and the role we need to play. So thank you for coming and joining us this evening. Thank you, V. Eric. So I am very happy to be part of this conversation tonight. I think it's very important um, because of the importance of the African-American people in the struggle for democratic rights and democratic freedom in the United States for the constant struggle for hundreds of years that has shaped our people and shaped our lives of which this movie is just a little taste. And I am very excited to hear the people who are on the panel discuss their experiences as well. I just wanted to say that in I did come in through the struggle to free Angela Davis and then um, all political prisoners and was uh, very proud to be part of the National Alliance against against racist and political repression and proud to be a part of the Communist Party and of the worldwide movement that we're the representative of here. So it, this is a wonderful chance to get to know more folks and more comrades and friends. And I'm just uh, pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Lee and uh, Eric. Uh, well, let's get to it. Tonight, we're gonna have a conversation as I said about the uh, about the movie and and but also about the Black Panther Party, the Panthers had a big impact, of course, on the in the history of this country. It had a big impact on me, as a really as a man child. I I remember when I was uh, right after Dr. King got killed, um, uh, the troops uh, occupied the playground. Uh, uh, in my hometown, there was a rebellion, a little re rebellion, and and the Panthers were our heroes, you know, and we Im imbibed and repeated their, their slogan. The day after the rebellion, we were walking down the street, and there were police cars sitting three or four deep, and I was there with three or four of my friends, and and uh, walking down the street, and, and all of a sudden, I saw oink, 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 oink. <laughs> And my friends were saying, Joe, why did you stop? And sure enough, the police rode up on us and we played dumb. But it was a it was a stupid and childish thing to do, but we were angry and the Panthers were our heroes. And and uh and so let's get started with the conversation. We we saw the movie and some people loved it and some people didn't like it so much. Uh, and we have a number of, of very fine uh, uh, of folks who, who have been involved in the movement for a long time to talk about it uh, this evening. Uh, we have uh, Rosanna Cambron, who is the co-chair of the Communist Party. And we're joined by uh, brother and our comrade Frank Chapman, who is the executive director of the National Alliance Against Racism and political repression. Welcome, welcome Frank and Rosanna. And also B. Lumpkin. B. Uh, Lumpkin is a long term uh, trade unionist and uh, political activist and communist. And when I say long term, I mean long term because B, bless her heart, is 102 years old. And so we're very, very happy to have her. And she goes all the way back to that struggle. Uh, she, she knew the Hampton family, and, and we're going to be uh, hearing from her. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, uh, Jafari Barrow, who's a young activist and, and YCL member from the great state of uh, Virginia. Um, so uh, as I was saying, some people loved it. Some people didn't like it so much. Uh, uh, I liked the movie. I had some criticisms of it. Some of them were serious, but I thought it was a fine piece of uh, acting and, and drama, uh, but it uh, was well-written. 
I did think that they used the MF word a little bit too much. You know, I don't know quite, quite what that was about. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, by and large, the, uh, the uh, writers did a, a fairly good job. But we want to talk about the writing, but also the politics. So let's get started. Uh, Rosanna, love it, hate it, in the middle. What did you think of the movie? Well, I, I, it was very intense and it was, there was a lot to think about as the movie, you know, progressed with the different characters and, and the intensity of how the informant and even the, the, who he was reporting to Mitchell was, they were being utilized by, by Hoover, how they were both being manipulated. I thought that was a very in, an interesting uh, component of the movie. Uh, I, I thought about people who are, who are just now seeing what ha was happening. What was their takeaway? I wondered what was their takeaway? You know, I was, I was only about 13 or so when all of this was happening. So I was just on the verge of, I remember the, the Black Berets. I remember that part of it, you know. My brother came home with one and they, uh, we lived in the barrio and, you know, in the Mexican American community. And he was told, uh, you know, he should not be wearing that. Uh, but, you know, he identified with that militancy. And so um, uh, it was, to me, just a very intense, but very informative uh, movie, I thought. Okay, fair enough. I think I was 11 or 12 and I had a big picture of Huey Newton on my wall in my bedroom and <laughs> Kathleen Cleaver and then for a minute I had Eldridge Cleaver up there and I found how Eldridge wasn't what, what he made himself out to be. Frank, uh, what did you think? Uh, love it, hate it? Uh, I know you watched it two times. I, I remember you. Actually more than that. that. Your face. <laughs> more than that. Uh... Yeah, I thought it was a, I, I thought it was a well done movie, you know. Uh, I I, I uh, unite with uh, Rosano on that. Um, I also thought it was a revealing movie, uh, particularly for people who don't know the history of the Panther Party or the history of that period. It very clearly uh, showed the role of Jagger Hoover as a uh, as an assassin. Uh, it, it came out pretty clear. That he was, uh, he he wanted Fred Hampton assassinated, and uh, also it showed the role of the FBI in terms of how a lot of the internal conflicts within the Panther Party, leading all the way up to murder, were were manipulated by the FBI, and of course we uh, we know all of that to be true as a result of the uh, COINTELPRO investigations that came, uh, you know, the congressional hearings around COINTELPRO, uh, which was hundreds of thousands of pages of information about how the FBI had infiltrated the Panthers and a number of other organizations of that era and um, uh, created problems across across the whole spectrum of the movement. But uh, the political message is a little foggy, in, in my opinion. Uh, what is the political message of the movie? <laughs> you know? I mean, uh, maybe somebody on this panel can tell me, uh, because in 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 the movie, it's it's, it's mixed. It's, you know, it's a it's a mixed message. On the one hand, it 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 shows the Panthers, uh, you know, in, in sort of a true light. But on the other hand, it 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 it, it, it it's, it's it's absolutely no understanding of how they develop to be what they are, uh, how they come about their views. Uh, the um, and if, if I go a little too long on this, stop me. Uh, you know, for example, uh, 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 the, he shows up at the at, at the Young Patriots uh, uh, meeting. Um, so why? <laughs> you know, uh, he shows up with the, with the uh, uh, with the Young Lords again. Why? And 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 in terms of political message, what was really important to me that was missing because we are a continuation of that struggle here in Chicago right now is that Fred Hampton really initiated the struggle for community controlled police here in Chicago 
and 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 the Rainbow Coalition, which consisted of the Young Lords, uh, and the Patriots and the Panther Party, were the uh, uh, foundation of that struggle. Shortly after the Alliance was founded in 1973, we joined up with them in in in, in a fight around the issue of community control of the police. None of that was that, you know. Uh, so so. But you know, the people who made the movie were not communists. The people who made the movie uh, 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 don't share my politics. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can allow for, for certain things, but uh, there was no clear political message for me, you know. Uh, it was very episodic when it, came to, when it came to the politics, you know. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I know there's gonna be a whole lot of other discussion. But I, okay. I, I, but I did enjoy it. Fair enough, fair enough. B, there was a mass radicalization of our people uh, during that time. You, you worked at a school uh, two or three blocks from where the murder of Fred Hampton uh, took place. You, uh, you knew his family. What were your impressions of the movie? Did you find it to be a realistic or truthful uh, presentation or was it just Hollywood uh, 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 centering in on sensationalism and violence and, and in, an, in an effort to maximize their profits? You wanna unmute uh, B? B, you need to unmute. I knew Fred. And uh, <clears throat> he was also a student at Malcolm X College at the time I was teaching there. Uh, so I was deeply affected personally by the events that are shown. I welcome the movie because it um, opens up the page back to who the Black Panthers were and the role that Fred Hampton played. And to that extent, it was good. But it gives just a tiny peek at what the BPP, the Black Panther Party, um, really did. If kids are getting food at school today, and that food is so important that even in this pandemic, when they have to close schools, they still try to make provision for supplying that food. All of that credit goes to the Black Panther Party. And if more of us are fighting for health care for all, I know in Chicago, they were getting sympathetic doctors to set up free clinics for the people who had no access to medical care. Beyond that, there was a reason that the fascist-minded police and FBI and government singled, well, they didn't single out, but because many leaders were killed. Um, but why he was at the top of their list. And that's because the family he came out of were union activists, his mom, Iberia, was a grievance chair for her union local at Argo Start in Argo, Illinois. 
and Fred worked there one summer, gaining the experience of seeing people, black, white, and brown, English speaking, non-English speaking, all working together in a common cause. And that made him very dangerous. So I don't want to take more than my due time because uh, right after he was assassinated, as they showed, uh, Malcolm X College, two blocks away, just about empty. And we all, all went over there immediately before the police closed it off. And the scene of over a hundred bullet holes in that, in that uh, door to the apartment, it, it, it was horrifying. And the way I really got to know his family after he, he was assassinated, the way his mother rallied uh, and his older brother uh, and worked to keep the, not only his memory, but the whole meaning of that movement alive was very inspiring. And I wanna give credit to one of our comrades, um, Joan Elbert in Maywood, who was very instrumental in keeping that scholarship in Fred Hampton's name alive. And it was really through her that I got my close association with the family. Um, yeah. But as uh, Frank said, the movie just scratched the surface. It didn't make the political message clear. But I'm still surprised they showed anything, you know. That's, that's a start that we should uh, take advantage of and make sure that we use it to uh, educate. And um, yes, you're right. I wasn't in the leadership or anything like that. Uh, but I still had a sense of the role that the Communist Party played at that time in Chicago in supporting the BPP and making it possible for them to make a lot of the connections he made, they made. Thank you very, very much, B. Jafari, uh, Hollywood made the movie, you know, good or bad. And one other criticism of it, though, is, is that they focus too much on the snitch uh, and not enough on Fred Hampton himself, uh, who was obviously a very gifted and brilliant uh, young revolutionary whose politics were how did you find it? Did, did you think that it was too much about the FBI and this nation, not enough about the Panthers? How did it, how did it move you? So, um, okay. were you asking me, Joe? Yes, you got the floor. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I like the movie. Uh, from a purely entertainment standpoint, I thought it was pretty good. Like, I, I wasn't bored or anything while I watched it. Um, even though I knew it was going to happen, that Fred Hampton was going to, you know, meet his demise at the end, I still found myself, you know, engaged with the plot. And it was interesting, and I wanted to see what would happen next. Um, I do agree with you that I think that they focus too much on the, uh, the Judas, William O'Neill. But, you know, it was the director's choice, so... We wasn't a, it was called Judas and the Black Messiah. I guess Judas came first in that title because it was centered on him. Um, so from an entertainment standpoint, I liked it. Uh, from a historical standpoint, 
I also think that, you know, they, they did a decent job with it. Um, I don't think they took any egregious, like, liberties with it. Um, one thing I wanted to note, though, uh, I think Frank mentioned that the politics of it was very uh, kind of vague. And I agree with that as well. Um, I don't think there was a concrete, direct uh, politic that the movie tried to push. There wasn't, they, they didn't go out of their way to try to make um, the Black Panther struggle look like the struggle that the audience should agree with. They definitely didn't put the uh, cops and the CIA in a good light, thank God, because they weren't good. But um, I don't think they, I don't think they were trying to advance that anyway. So it was a little bit vague. However, as Communist Party members, I feel that there's a few things that we could parse from the movie that have to do directly with our struggle, um, which I'll probably touch on more as the conversation goes on. Um, the United Front and the Broad Coalition, these were, these were things that popped up a couple of times. Uh, the time when he was, when Fred Hampton and the Black Panther Party went to go speak to the young lords and the young patriots, um, that, that's coalition building when it comes to other, other radical organizations, even though they were speaking to gangs, they were still speaking to radical organizations in the area. So that's one thing that we can parse from it as communist party members. And another thing I think that we can see from the movie was um, the dangers of adventurism. Uh, there was a lot of that that happened there. Uh, Henry Winston speaks about that in his book, Strategy for a Black Agenda. He spends an entire chapter talking about how um, Eldridge Cleaver in his line for the Black Panther Party was an adventurous line and it was an incorrect line because it was very emotional. It was emotionally driven and it, it pushed for terrorist acts. So I think that's another thing that even though the movie had a vague uh, politic, that we can take those two things and see it as relevant to our struggle. But yeah, overall, I thought that the movie was pretty good. I thought it was good from an entertainment standpoint. And I thought we could learn stuff from it, even though it was a Hollywood movie. And they didn't touch on uh, Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought that much. But like I said, it's a Hollywood movie. It's um, an hour and so. It's not, gonna, it's not a full documentary that's going to go into the core of how the politics go. And it, and it wasn't entirely focused on Fred Hampton. So I'd expect that much even before going into the movie. But yeah, I liked it a lot. Okay, thank you, Jafari. In a few minutes, we're gonna take questions uh, from all of the folks who have joined us from around the country. If you have a question, please uh, I'll put it in the Q&A box or you can put it in the chat box and uh, we'll collect the questions and and give our panelists a chance to answer them. Uh, Craig, um, Craig, one of the strong points of the movie uh, was the intensity of the FBI assault and the Chicago Police Department assault on the Black Panther Party. You, you were in the Panthers in New Haven and then I think you went down to Louisiana and you had to uh, come back up to New Haven. And, and you said people really don't have a sense of how uh, deep and how uh, dramatic and how, in, how intense that was. You wanna uh, share a little bit of your thinking on that? Craig, are you there? I can't hear you. You might be muted. You can't. Can I You hear me now? Yes, go ahead. OK. I think one of the things that uh, in 1968, uh, when the assassination of Martin Luther King took place, uh, it sort of got a lot of people excited, even though the Panther Party was being discussed in various areas in New Haven, Connecticut. It didn't formulate into a real organization until after that in 1968. Uh, one of the things that happened uh, during that period of time because of the, the unrest and et cetera that was going on in New Haven, the Panther Party came out out as a strong stabilizing organization to organize people into a real kind of fight back. And it got, uh, uh, it got me interested 
even though I was trying to organize people at Yale New Haven Hospital, I spent much of my time trying to become a member, what they call at the time, a member trainee in the Panther Party. Many of the, the programs like the Breakfast for Kids and the Clothing Drive and, and passing out the paper and having uh, educational meetings and stuff is some of the things that I, I took part in. And we didn't find out until later on about the chief of police, who was Nicholas Pastor, who had aligned himself with the FBI to start an infill, even way back then, to infiltrate the, the, the leadership of black organizations in New Haven. And the Panther Party was one of them. And a, another thing, because of the street crime unit connection with various other social organizations like the Flaming Knights Motorcycle Club, where they recruited some some people in, in that organization to join the Panther Party and to keep tabs on what was going on uh, in New Haven. Because people were waiting for such an organization that presented itself as strong and had an idea. If we go back to the Panther Party 10-point program, to me, it's a platform for reparation and all of the things that are happening right now in that 10-point program. And as I read it as a young person, I think I was 23, 24 years old, I had just come out of the military and I just felt like uh, it, this was something that I needed to be involved in because of the racism and the separation, the projects where all of the black people lived in projects. The Hamilton Street project was me and a, a friend of mine named Lenny. That was the place we passed out newspapers on Wednesdays. We had education programs. The Panther Party just caught on like fire. It went from New Haven to Bridgeport to Springfield, Massachusetts, and we have people coming to New Haven to get direction and stuff. So it uh, every time I talk about it, I get excited and I get nervous at the same time because of the things that we experience. You know, different people that we didn't know popping up in the office, popping up. And that's what happened with George Sam. He came out of California, and our uh, information about him was that he had came from SNCC. Not that he had came from the, uh, he had came from SNCC and was uh, had been sent by the national headquarters. All of this stuff was was lied, and because of the heavy phone tapping, et cetera, we had couriers between New York City and Springfield and different other places. And that's how Alec Rockley got caught up in that and was used as a pawn to destroy the Panther Party. Thank you. That's uh, Thank you. what I have to say right now, Dill. Was George Sands the snitch from New Haven that they talked about in the movie who was allegedly tortured by the Okay, that's what uh, I was wondering. Yeah, he, uh, if, go ahead, Craig. He wasn't from New Haven. The people in New Haven had never seen him before. I was at the uh, the party headquarters the day before they murdered Alex Rackley. And because I didn't know him and because of the conversation he and I had, I picked up my my bundles of papers, and the person, uh, Lenny, who was with me, I said, something's not right about this guy. And I told George Sam to his face, I don't know you, and I don't take orders from you. So I grabbed my bundle of papers and left uh, the party headquarters that day. Okay. 
Yeah. You know, uh, one of the uh, things I, I was um, interested in hearing some conversation about was the portrayal of women in the uh, a movie, because you know, there's been a critique of uh, in the last period of the um, uh, a lot of male supremacy in the Panthers. Uh, uh, and um, but the movie, Rosanna, did you get a sense of how did you, did it strike you in any particular way, the, the way the women characters were portrayed Actually, in the did. film? I, I, it did. I thought, you know, the women were treated with respect. There was that moment where uh, I think it was the, the snitch was kind of coming on to another woman and they made him do uh, push-ups and stuff like that. And, and um, even the relationship between, uh, I forget her name, and, and Hampton, I think was, was handled well. You know, I, 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 I was, that's something that, that uh, stick out in my mind. Um, I did want to say that I think that one of the, well, at least one of the messages that stuck into my mind, because they, they pointed it out a couple of times was the issue of the power of the people. You know, there were some, even when the bombs, the first bombs and the people came out to, to, uh, to clean up the, uh, after it was bombed and cooperate. And um, I forget there was a couple other scenes where the power of the people was sort of pointed out. So I, I think, uh, you know, I, I would hope that people who don't know much about the, the, what happened at that time would pick up that, at least that element of it. The power of the people can bring change and united, you know, and the unity uh, to bring, you know, of a movement. Absolutely, and the Panther movement was a spark. It lit a spark, and you saw that spark continue to uh, uh, grow and and burn. And and uh, I think it was seven or eight years later that it burned into that tremendous movement that was led by Harold Washington uh, when he was elected mayor of uh, Chicago. I want to uh, talk just briefly, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience about Fred Hampton himself. Frank, you said a number of times, uh, I want to ask you and I want to ask B, uh, that he was a unique person. Uh, the Panthers were kind of ideologically uh, heterogeneous. There were many different trends. But Hampton represented a politics of a new type. He was, he was, uh, he had a deep understanding of things, Frank. Don't you think? I mean, what, what's your, well, he was what, a what's your take? Panther that I knew, uh, and I, I didn't know him personally. I know his brother personally, Bill Hampton. Uh, in fact, I was, I was in, I was in jail when this, when this went down. I was, I was 27 years old in the Missouri State Penitentiary. Uh, but he, he to, to my memory, he, he was the only Panther that I know of who, who openly, uh, 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 you know, announced himself a communist uh, uh, and, and talked about the totalitarian revolution and, 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 and was a very strong and uncompromising advocate of socialism. Uh, I knew a lot of Panthers. I didn't know too many like that, you know. Of course, it probably would have been different if I'd have been in New York. You know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I thought politics was very advanced in terms of the Panther Party because the Panther Party had had a, had a real mixed bag of politics, uh, and, and, and I, I believe that even back then, when when I was uh, when I was in the joint and and, uh, and, and striving to become a communist myself. Um, but yeah, he 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 was, uh, and you know some of the things that he did practically, you know, it's all about practice. Uh, were advanced, uh, like the Rainbow Coalition, bringing together the uh, uh, you know members of the Puerto Rican community, uh, the the, uh, the 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 poor white white people, and uh, and 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 forging a coalition. That 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 actively fought for community control of the police in this city and created the foundations of the movement that we got going on here now for the same thing, 
we're, we're a continuation of what Fred Hampton started because we are, we are currently fighting for uh, community control of the police and we now have an ordinance pending in the city council to that effect. And we, uh, we openly and, and, and proudly acknowledge that Fred Hampton was our predecessor in this fight. That's a hell of an accomplishment and congratulations on getting that ordinance in the city council uh, of Frank. It's setting an example for the country. B, any, any thoughts about Fred himself uh, and uh, his politics and, and, and the environment uh, that drew him to those kinds of conclusions? You're muted. He was very warm hearted. Um, there was a really tense situation going on at Malcolm X College and well, the whole West Side, you could say. Um, And we had a college president who had been sent in, I believe, not by the FBI, but the CIA, because that's worse, who came in as a flaming radical and got the consent of the student government to be hired because we did that in those days. And by less than three years later, was the head of the re-elect Nixon, Blacks for Nixon re-election. Be you muted yourself again. Be, you, you, you muted yourself again, right after you said the guy came in as a flaming radical and ended up supporting Nixon. <laughs> Be, you're, you're muted. We can't, we can't hear you. Hey, Joe. He was never go. a flaming radical. He was sent in by the CIA to do a job on the Black Panther Party. Mm. And, uh, oh, I mean, this, I try to write about a little of it in my uh, autobiography, uh, uh, Joy in the Struggle, because in a way it was symptomatic of what happened to the Black Panther Party. Uh, but he had worked the student body up. Uh, for example, the day after um, Mal This is getting me so excited. I'm <laughs> forgetting names. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, Dr. Hurst, that's the head of Malcolm X College, went into that student assembly. He worked the student body up. This is when he was still the flaming radical. And the police department sent in a helicopter that landed in the schoolyard. Uh, and they were terrorizing, the, you know, the students. Um, So it was a very tense scene. And his, uh, his special target, of course, so, uh, you know, was white women. Uh, and uh, I came in um, and it was, I don't know what happened before I came into Malcolm X doors, which was shared with the high school then. Uh, but I could see something had happened. They were about four that uh, 
four young men looked at me with a lot of hostility. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. And uh, Fred Hampton came in just at that moment. He sized the whole thing up, came over, put his arms around me, and we went in together. Um, so that's what I mean about his being uh, warm-hearted. I mean, uh, uh, an example. Um, The other thing I want to mention is that as a teacher, you know, there was all of this commiseration about how far behind the students on the West Side were and so forth. Well, some of these young people who had become inspired by the Black Panther Party began to try to study Marxism, Leninism. And although they had not uh, been doing much reading before then, they found a way to read all of those big words and all of that. So to me as a teacher, that meant that the motivation is there. You know, we can accomplish uh, miracles in education. So there was a bad aspect of, uh, uh, and in fact, I got so bold as to put up a big poster of Lenin in my office there and <laughs> with the slogan, I forget what it was, it was in Russian and the students, uh, would ask me about it, and I told them the inspire, inspiring thing Lenin was saying. They got all excited. <laughs> all right. So all right. I think they were hoping the Soviet Union would come in and rescue them. But, you know. <laughs> well, that didn't quite happen, but everything. We're going to have to rescue ourselves. Uh, that's pretty clear. Um, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, Michael, do we have a, a couple that uh, we can, uh, once again, if you want to ask a question, please put it in the chat. I see that there are 20 messages there, so there must be um, some good questions. Have you been able to, Michael, put some together? Yeah, and so the first question was, um, I believe it was from Shanti here, and she wanted to know, uh, she has heard about the connection between the Communist Party and the Black Panther Party in Los Angeles. But um, I guess this is the question others could answer. How about the, the connection between the Black Panther Party and the Communist Party in Chicago, or I guess in the case of Craig, uh, New Haven? What were the, the parallels there? Were there any connections at all? Craig, you want to start? Yeah. Um, in fact, you know, uh, we shouldn't minimize the influence that the, the Communist Party had on the Panther Party. And one of the thing, one of the important issues were uh, organizing unions and stuff. When I was in the Panther Party uh, in 1969, uh, some communists, uh, uh, Roosevelt and Heist, was organizing the Jewish home. And, and that's where I met uh, people from the Communist Party. I was in the Panther Party because right down the street from, uh, from the Jewish home, we had a house that we used that house for distributing breakfast for kids and a clothing drive. And and they were having a demonstration uh, at the Jewish home to organize 1199 workers. So uh, I went over there just to uh, uh, be a part of the demonstration. And that's when I, I met Roosevelt Ward and Hyde Steinberg. We developed a really great relationship because then I began to go 
to the New Haven People's Center and uh, uh, the Communist Party uh, at that time helped us to uh, organize the concerned house workers, uh, hospital workers at Yale New Haven Hospital. The other issues around uh, a disrespect for women, oh, those kinds of things was introduced in our meetings because of us talking with people from the Communist Party. So we shouldn't minim minimize, you know, uh, the tremendous influence that uh, people like Roosevelt High, Sid, and different other members of the, of, of the party at the time. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Anyone else want to talk about the relationship between the party and, and the, uh, and the uh, Panthers? Either in Chicago or uh, in St. Louis or, uh, or any other. I know that uh, William Patterson uh, played a very significant role in working with the Panthers uh, uh, in the late 60s. Um, anyone? All right, we'll continue to think about it and uh, let's. Uh, uh, see if uh, we can get another question. Michael? Dante asks if there was, um, how close was uh, Fred Hampton's politics to those of Bobby Seals? How close was Fred's politics to that of, of Bobby Seals? Frank, you're laughing. <laughs> Any takers? Yeah, they, 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 listen, listen to him. <laughs> Uh, in, in terms of, of of certain issues, of course, it was very it was very close. But uh, but, but but as I said earlier, Fred was uh, head and shoulders above. Uh, uh, I think both Bobby Seale and Huey P. knew when it came to the question of socialism, and um, I don't know nobody in the party that had politics like he had, you know. Uh, and I and 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 at the time, I was just listening. But as I got when I got out to Jordan, I, I started working with, 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 you know, members of the Panther Party. Well, former members. By the time I got out, I was, by the time I got out, the Panther Party was pretty much liquidated. But uh, you know, uh, that was that was the 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 attitude among some of the uh, uh, party members that I knew as well. You know, uh, particularly Bill Hampton, Fred's Fred's brother. You know, so. Um, but uh, you know. On the, on the question of, 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 of communists here in Chicago, I know that Ishmael Flory was uh, uh, was talking to, to, to the Panthers, but I don't know who else because I wasn't in Chicago at the time. Uh, B would know more about that probably than, the, than anybody I know, uh, but uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Frank. Michael, another question? Yeah, Naomi or Naima asks, are there types of organizing that you feel that Hollywood and this uh, specifically in this film missed out on portraying what would be helpful for young people now to see or hear or understand? So the question again uh, to our panelists, uh, are there forms of organizing that uh, Hollywood missed out on uh, that the Panthers were engaged in that would be helpful for uh, young people uh, to emulate today. Anybody? Yeah, uh, Joe, I think Go ahead, the, most, the most important thing, I think, is building coalitions. One of the things that we did in New Haven to, uh, in terms of building coalitions with with uh, Yale students, with the uh, 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 young doctors at Yale Haven Hospital to build, to uh, set up uh, clinics and stuff in, in the community was very important. But in order to get those, that kind of information, we had to interact with people in the Communist Party, people with uh, different other progressive organizations to get names, to find buildings, to find grocery stores that would give us the outdated food 
clothing stores that would give us seasonal stuff. It all had to do with reaching out to other organizations and then being able to, who, who was the contact person that we had to talk to? Who is this person? Where are they coming from? So uh, today, you know, as we talk about trying to deal with racism and discrimination, building coalitions on common grounds was very helpful for us. All right. Uh, anybody else want to respond to that question? I knew about the uh, breakfast program, and uh, that's kind of been an inspiration for much of the mutual aid that is taking place uh, today. Um, and uh, and then there was the free clinic. Uh, one thing I learned about this evening was the scholarship program. I wasn't aware that the uh, Panthers were involved in and providing those kinds of scholarship uh, programs. Any other comments on Naima's question? Yeah, I, I if, think. If, go yeah. ahead, Rosanna. Yeah, I think the lesson also is being grounded in the community, being in the community, among the community, and building that relationship, because it was through that uh, that form that they were able to even build that solidarity among you know other groups and and uh build that movement and i think that you know that's that's where we need to be always in the community and building relationships and building that movement that's necessary thank you rosanna michael let's take one more question and then we'll, i have a question to pose to the panelists and then we'll try to wrap up you have one more yeah, um, this one is about, uh, it's from Scott Grossman, and he says, I believe in the movie they included one or two quotes from Mao Zedong. Did Comrade Hampton's speeches include more of that sort of thing, namely bringing attention to communist thinkers? So the question is, did Hampton's speeches reflect the thinking of, of communist thinkers? Uh, I think Frank kind of answered that question. Uh, as did uh, a B. I think that, Frank, you want to take it again? Uh, well, restate the question, uh, if you don't mind. The question Michael? was, um, there were one or two quotes from Mao in the movie that Fred said. So um, did Comrade Hampton or Fred Hampton did his speeches include more of that sort of thing, bringing attention to great communist thinkers? Like, you know, what was the, I guess, the ideological approach from Fred Hampton and the Panthers overall? Yeah, he, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. He quoted Mao. He quoted Lenin. Yeah, he quoted communist thinkers. Uh, the, the thing I remember him saying about the quote I remember from Mao in the movie was, uh, uh, "Politics is war without bloodshed, and war is politics with bloodshed." Uh, and also he talked about political power coming from the barrel of, of a gun, you know, uh, which, you know, though I'm not, I'm not criticizing the quotes per se, but they kind of ring hollow, <laughs> you know, in, in, in a movie where the political content is so scattered, you know, I mean, what does that mean really? <laughs> uh, but um, the, uh, yeah, he, he, he quoted profusely from, uh, uh, from, from, from from, from internationally known communists, particularly Lenin, Mao Zedong, Stalin, you know, people like that. All right, thank you. And he also applied the uh, strategy of George Dimitrov, the United Front uh, concept and strategy, as, as uh, B and Frank right. and uh, others were saying, uh, with his approach to broad coalitions of white, black, Puerto Rican, uh, and so on and so forth. This is a good segue into uh, trying to wrap up. And I thought that we might talk a little bit about the issue of community defense and what that means today and what kinds of lessons might be drawn, both positive and negative with respect to uh, the strategy that the uh, Panthers employed uh, because we saw that tremendous repression that, that took place. Uh, and uh, Winnie makes the point in Strategy for a Black Agenda uh, that when they uh, picked up a shotgun, 
and they picked up the rifle to kind of open themselves up to provocation. Um, and uh, so uh, we're in a situation now where our people are being killed by the police. We got that trial taking place in Minneapolis now. Uh, how do we define community defense today? And, and what are the uh, avenues that we need to walk down uh, in order to uh, make that happen? Um, uh, does anybody want to take a crack at that? How yeah, do we build would. the kind of, uh, go on. Yeah, um, so as far as community defense goes, like you said, uh, it was really important in the movie. Um, it's kind of, it was pivotal to the Panther strategy to have uh, community defense because they were, they were under an antagonistic threat from the police, the FBI and the CIA. They hounded them constantly. Um, if we, we are to be like historical materialists, then we have to understand the institution that uh, destroyed Fred Hampton's life, um, destroyed the Pratt Panthers ultimately, uh, just terrorized them endlessly. They're still doing that today. They're, they're still doing that in Chicago. They, they're pretty much, um, they, the institution transformed it. We know as dialectical materialists that things don't end and begin statically. They kind of are transforming and are constantly in motion, but the essence is still there that the police, the FBI and the CIA are reactionary. They are defenders of property. They're defenders of the bourgeoisie. Um, they want to harken back to a time where police have even more power. They want to take power away from people. They're the, the same police who destroyed George Floyd's life is the same police who destroyed their life. So community defense is important. I think we do need to approach that. I think what community defense may look like today is um, making it so that the community itself is the one making sure that those terroristic, those antagonistic forces of the police and the FBI are kept in check because at the end of the day, um, we're the ones who make up our community. So we're the ones who have to ultimately defend our community. They're, they're outside the community in that they aren't for the workers. They aren't for the people. They aren't for the masses. They're pretty much to protect power. So I think it is important that we keep community defense. The only question is, as, as you just asked, Joe, how does that look today? And well, you know, we, we kind of have to study that. We kind of have to understand how the Black Panthers did it. We also have to understand how maybe in other communist organizations or in other communities, how they did it. And then we have to apply it to our material conditions here. So if that looks exactly like the Black Panthers in some places where they're actually armed and they, they actually have like a organization that does the same things that the Black Panthers do, then that could work for them. But we have to understand that, you know, we must look at our material conditions and see where community defense is really needed and we need to see how to do it. But I think ultimately what my point is, is that the community defense is necessary because the same antagonistic forces are still against us. Um, they're still against our revolution and they're still gonna terrorize our communities. So as a very start, yes, we, we do need community defense and we need to defend ourselves from that stuff. Okay, thank you, Jafari. Rosanna, and then yeah, uh, B, what does community defense look like today when we're fighting a fascist danger and police departments and vigilantes of all different kinds? Yeah, I, I think we'd make a grave error if we, if we took up arms. I think it would be the huge, a huge mistake. I think for me, community defense looks more about, looks like building that community you know, and being grounded in your community so that the community will rise up and defend you as, as opposed to any other force. Uh, I think uh, arms, it only gives the police and the FBI and all of those structures a reason to come after you. So you don't want to fall into that trap. Uh, I don't think uh, that that's the, the most helpful way. I think the most important way is to build the community, build the consciousness of your community so that they don't get uh, fall into the trap either and that they are ready to take up uh, you know, and lift their voices and, 
and uh, be out there in the streets, but in a peaceful way, because that's not only that, that's how you gain support, not just from your community, but also from communities uh, across the nation, across the world. Uh, that's how you build that community, which then builds that pressure to uh, to bring about the change that you're looking for, and not be attacked in the way the Black Panthers were attacked. That's it. Thank you, Rosanna B. One of the uh, Black Panther Party's 10 points was a school curriculum that included Black history and um, I, I think that's something that's the uh, coming more to fruition these days. I know it's something I've been very involved in and I think their message lives on in that way. But the basic way I think they won such broad community support was the attention they paid to issues like feeding the children and providing medical care. And I think that's a real lesson for us today. Thank you, B. Craig? Yeah, Craig, Joe. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. One of the things that I think uh, we have to do is take an honest look at the mistakes that uh, the Panther Party made in terms of defending themselves from uh, these agent provocateurs. We have to figure out a way to get in front of it. And one of those ways is, is what I found when I went to different projects and I took the paper and I took the 10 point program and had classes. Once people found out what our purpose was and what our goals were, they began to come in and defend us. You know, they began to be felt like they were a part of the Panther Party, even though they weren't wearing berets and black jackets and stuff. So we need to use these kind of conversations that we are having right now openly so that we can fight for for uh, civilian review boards and different other things that keep the spotlight on police brutality and on the injustices that continue. So. All right, thank you, Craig. Frank, you get the last word. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the Panthers came up with the idea of community control of the police at that very critical moment in their existence as a party when they were under police attacks, when their members were being killed, when they were being racist, when, when they were, you know, being racially framed up uh, uh, for crimes that, that, that they had not committed. And so they, 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 they came out of the, it, this comes out of the heart of their experience of police repression and police tyranny in our communities, being directed at the Black Liberation Movement, being directed at movements, period, because as, we've, as we all know, this was a much broader program. The COINTELPRO program was a much broader program. And they, I think they came up with a brilliant idea. And that idea was community control of the police. And that's exactly how they framed it. I'm not, I'm not, putting any sugar on it. They, 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 they framed it exactly like that. And the reason why they framed it exactly like that is because they knew that, you know, arm insurrection wasn't working, you know, uh, and, 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 that the, and that the main people that was pushing for these sorts of things was police. The, 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 the people who was calling for armed struggle and all that stuff within the Panther Party was the police, you know, uh, clear and simple. So, so they learned in the dirt and blood of battle that there's a better way of going about this. And, and, and they gave us the better way, community control of the police. And so that's what we need to fight for. And that's very critical right now because see, 
Laquan McDonald, who was shot 17 times, was not a member of the Black Panther Party. George Elliott, I mean, not George Elliott, George Floyd was not a member of the Black Panther Party. Breonna Taylor was not a member of the Black Panther Party. So, but this kind of repression is still going on. The black community is still living under a system of police tyranny unmatched anywhere on, on the planet. You know, unless you want to go to the apartheid days of South Africa. So this is our struggle now. A mass defense movement. We got to put the police in check and that's a democratic struggle because we have an, an, an unalienable democratic right to say who polices our communities and how our communities are police. And we can organize the masses, black, brown, and white to fight for this. And we're doing that here in Chicago. And we're also doing it in Florida. We're also doing it in Texas. We're also doing it in, 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 in Minneapolis where uh, 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 George Floyd was murdered. So this is, uh, this is what the strategy has to be. It has to be, to get community control of the police because right now they are a major block in the road to black liberation. Major block. Absolutely. Major block. And mm -hmm. getting them out of the way means creating organizing space for those movements that we need to flourish. For full movements for employment, you know, uh, housing, all of these things. Are affected by police repression. So, 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 so to the extent that, that we effectively organize a fight against that repression, against that police tyranny that is hanging over our communities right now, to that extent will we create organizing space for a healthy development of the Black Liberation Movement. Thank you, Frank. Uh, and I want to thank all of the uh, uh, folks who uh, showed up tonight, and especially our panelists. For me, one of the most powerful moments in the film was when the snitch went into his trunk and pulled out a couple of sticks of dynamite and walked over to uh, a Fred and, and the other brother who was there. And Fred looked at him and said, are you out of your blanking mind? Are you, have you completely lost it? Y'all remember that? That was, it is always the police the cops, the FBI, who provoke violence in order to set people up, to send them to jail or kill them. And, and that happened uh, uh, repeatedly to the Panthers. A mass defense of our communities, black, white, Latino, Asian, uh, means community control of the police. And community control of the police means creating uh, through mass public pressure, uh, boards that are elected from the community that, 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 that control hiring and firing and budgets. You wanna defund the police, you know, fight for legislation in our city councils and state legislatures so that the people in each particular community uh, can set up a, 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 a control board, not a review board, but a control board that is able to decide who is hired, who is fired, what the budget is, um, and how it is distributed. I think that's what's happening in Chicago. There are steps in that direction, and that has to happen all over the, uh, all over the uh, country. Um, thank you all very much for showing up. Thank you, B. It was so great to hear your story. Thank you, Rosanna, for your wisdom tonight. Thank you, Jafari. Thank you, Craig. Next time we're gonna get your camera on. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, this was a meeting of the party's uh, uh, African-American Equality Commission. We'll be holding other such sessions as the time goes on. And I wanna in particular thank uh, Zenovia, and Eric for agreeing to lead this work. Uh, it, is, it is so important now. There's such a tremendous mass radicalization of our people and, and in particular of our youth. And our party and our commission has a very important uh, role to play in, in, in helping nurture 
uh, uh, develop and learning from it and learning from it. This is this is really important. So good night, all. Thank you. Hey, uh, we ain't going nowhere. We'll be back. Take care. Have a good night. Good night, Jeff. All right. See ya.